Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to a kind of special edition here on uh, the YouTube channel. Today, we're going to talk about kind of the origins of how this all started, my origins in music, uh, how Sea of Tranquility started, the website started, how the YouTube channel started, the whole shebang, because we've been getting so many questions from a lot of viewers on, you know, how how you created this whole thing and then you know when did you get started in music and so on and so forth so I'm gonna kinda of take you through the journey of uh, Mr. Pardo here over the course of the last 53 years and uh, tell you how we wound up here today alright so we're gonna go back to probably uh, I was born in the mid 60s uh, originally born in uh, Brooklyn New York and we moved to uh, Goshen New York right around the beginning of the 70s and my first musical memories Kind of, I remember mom and dad always playing AM radio everywhere we went. So either it was on the kitchen, it was on the dining room, it was definitely on the car, listened to radio outside. And I remember back in the day really being hooked on a lot of like pop music. You know, some of you heard me say, you know, many, many times, you know, Brandy by the Looking Glass, one of my, you know, absolute favorite songs from the early 70s. But a lot of those pop tunes I really, really loved. Even the stuff from the late 60s, the early 70s. If it was on the radio, I loved it. And so I always remember, like, great memories of music. Uh, and again, I think I've told this story before. If I haven't, we're going to hear it again. Uh, I was a big comic book guy. When I was a comic book kid, I should say. When I was a little kid, I was collecting comics at a very early age, probably started around four or five years old. And on the weekends, you know, my dad worked in New York City. We lived in upstate New York. My dad worked in New York City all week, so we really didn't see him a lot during the week, except, you know, late at night when he got home. And so on the weekends, you know, dad would take my brother and I, who was, you know, he's three and a half years younger than me. He would take us in the car and we'd drive into town where he'd go to buy the newspapers at this very cool newsstand that also sold a bunch of comics, right? So my brother and I would happily jump in the car with dad and dad would have the AM radio on, the old Plymouth Fury, right? And he'd be cranking, uh, you know, AM radio and we'd hear all these great musical songs and just really... Loved the trip. It was only a five-minute ride into town, listening to music, uh, getting our comic books, you know, sitting in the car, reading comic books, listening to all sorts of cool stuff on the radio. So fast forward a couple of years, <clears throat> and probably right around, I think it was 1975 or 76, probably 76. I was right about either 9 or 10 years old. And we had uh, my, my parents had some really good friends who were a little bit older than them. And they had a, uh, their youngest daughter was a little bit older than me. She was probably like three or four or five years older than me. And we had gone over to their house for dinner one weekend. And I, my brother and I were, was hanging, were hanging with their daughter. And she's like, you got to hear this, this great new band. And she put this album on. And my ears were like, wow, that is awesome. The band was Kiss. The album was Kiss Alive. And at the time, you know, I, as a kid, grew up loving, like, monsters and horror films. You know, I would spend hours and hours and hours on watching the local TV channels, watching the old Frankenstein, Dracula, the Mummy, the Wolfman, Creature from the Black Lagoon. I loved Godzilla. Any Godzilla movies I loved. King Kong. Anything horror monster related, I was into as a kid. So to see, and I, of course, I love superheroes, right? So seeing these guys in Kiss wearing these costumes and the makeup, playing this kind of loud, raucous music, it just grabbed me. <clears throat> and there's been no looking back since then. So I immediately, you know, I my dad would give me a little bit of allowance uh, every week, which I normally would spend on comic books. All of a sudden, it was like, I got to go out and buy some Kiss records, right? So I went out and actually Destroyer had just come out. So I went out and bought Destroyer. Uh, about a month later, I went out and bought Kiss Alive. And then, you know, before you know it, Love Gun is out. And I would save up my allowance because at the time, you know, LPs were like, what, $4.99, $5.99, $6.99, the most, you know, something like that. So, you you know, you'd have to save your money. You'd get a buck a week or 50 cents a week or whatever it was. So it'd take you a little while. But um, before you know it, I was buying Kiss albums and I was a Kiss fanatic probably for the next eh, about four years. I think by the time the Dynasty album came out, uh, I was already, and I liked that album, but I was already kind of starting to move into other things. So while I was listening to Kiss, I also was really getting into bands like Paul McCartney and Wings, Kansas, uh, 
Genesis, Boston, Meatloaf, the Eagles, the Steve Miller Band, Electric Light Orchestra. That was kind of like my world right around that time until I think it was late 1979. I went over to a buddy's house and he's like, check this album out that I got a hold of. And he put it on. And the first notes of and I was like, of course, that was Black Sabbath's Paranoid album. And as much as Kiss kind of changed my life, I think Black Sabbath is the band that just absolutely did it for me. And that just took me on a path to much, much heavier music. So all that stuff that I was kind of listening to at the time, I still liked, but Sabbath brought me to Deep Purple, brought me to Led Zeppelin, and then literally not long after that was Judas Priest and Maiden and Scorpions and Rainbow and White Snake, and I was totally into heavy music at that point. And, you know, the early 80s for me was, uh, you know, Dio, the Dio band, and then in like, God, what year was it? Forgive me if the dates are incorrect. Maybe 92 or 93, I don't know, I mean, sorry, 82 or 83, uh, the first time I heard Metallica, all of a sudden, you know, I would I went to another level, right? And so I was listening to Slayer and Venom and Celtic Frost and Megadeth and Anthrax and Overkill and you know Destruction and Creator and God, I'm, you know, Testament and Blind Illusion and Possessed, and then you know, later in the decade, Death. I you know I became a huge, huge thrash fan, big time was. Big time into thrash. I was going to all the clubs, you know, while I was going to college in the, the mid to late 80s. I was going to the clubs, seeing thrash bands. I was in the mosh pits, all that kind of stuff. You know, I had hair down the middle of my back. I was wearing the bracelets with the spikes and all that kind of stuff. It was totally into that scene. Totally into it. So fast forward, you know, I'm out of college, late 80s, um, going to the work scene, working a bunch of jobs here and there. Worked in New York City for a couple of years in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, the 90s for me were a strange decade because, you know, grunge came along. I remember like working for this company in like 1992 um, and I, I was there for like six years. And I remember like a lot of the people who worked, uh, who I worked with were, uh, you know, a good five, six, ten years younger than me. Well, not ten years younger, but a good five, five to eight years younger than me. I was in my early, mid-twenties. And, you know, the grunge, the Seattle scene, just and the alternative music scene, just kind of, they were totally into that. And I remember when that stuff first came out, you know, I was into, uh, I liked Soundgarden a bit. I liked Alice in Chains. I initially got into Pearl Jam and Nirvana and Stone Temple Pilots, but then I, I you know, that didn't last long. Uh, Soundgarden and Alice in Chains I've always liked throughout my life, but um, those other bands I grew tired of pretty damn quickly. And the metal scene was just kind of like, Everything started going the underground. You know, you had the 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 birth of like extreme metal, which I started getting into early on, like late in the '80s, like you know, Death and a lot of those kind of the Florida bands. But then, like once the '90s hit, because I was kind of so like disassociated with the Seattle scene and the alternative music scene, and a lot of the bands that I really really liked were just kind of struggling, or like a lot of those '80s hard rock and metal bands were then trying to mimic the Seattle sound. I was just not into that. You know, bands like Dokken and Queensryche were all trying to do stuff like that, and it just didn't work. And, you know, Metallica changed changed their ways a bit after the Black Album, and I just moved away from metal and went towards progressive music. Started with Dream Theater. I remember hearing that first, very first Dream Theater album when Dream and Day Unite, and I was like, holy crap, you know, what is this? Is this some new Rush album I hadn't heard, right? Um, and just totally getting into them. And then I started to get much deeper into bands that I had been into, but not heavily back in the late seventies and the early eighties, like Yes and Genesis and King Crimson. And, uh, I discovered Gentle Giant and all the Italian bands and Emerson, you know, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, all this stuff, the whole Kansas catalog. Uh, I just, I just really, really dove deep into Marillion. IQ. I got really deep into Queen and Jethro Tull. A lot of these bands, again, Saga, that I had known, liked some of their stuff, but never because I was such a metalhead throughout the 80s, and I just completely embraced the progressive rock and progressive metal scenes, big time throughout the 90s. In fact, much of like the, you know, heavy metal groups of the 90s, 
uh, I just kind of like lost touch with for a while. I think Pantera was one of the few that I was listening to. I still kept up with like Megadeth and you know a couple other and some of the thrash stuff, but for the most part, I didn't listen to a ton of like classic metal stuff in the '90s. It wasn't until like the you know '99, 2000 uh, that I started getting back into the metal scene because kind of, you know metal was kind of back. You know the grunge scene, the Seattle scene, alternative music kind of was dying out. New metal came in. You know you had Corn and all those other bands, but Right around 1990, I'm going to say it was 97 or 98, um, I started to get a bug about writing, okay? Specifically, you know, the prog band, the prog stuff really got me interested in talking about, learning about and talking about, listening to, and just spreading the word of this kind of cool new music. And as you know, you have bands like the Flower Kings and Spock's Beard and Anglegard, Anecdoten, uh, Glass Hammer, all these kind of cool new bands that were popping up on the scene that I was getting into that I was like, holy cow, you know, Symphony X and all this stuff. And I wound up getting uh, associated with this website called Prognet, okay, which was basically kind of like a forum for people like me who were discovering progressive rock and bands, maybe for the first time, or maybe uh, people who had been into it back in the 70s, but kind of fell away from it. And with the growing scene again, because the 90s were a big decade for, you know, this third prog rock movement. And so I started doing like album reviews for this Prognet community, which I thought was a lot of fun. Again, uh, you know, I was new at it, whatever. And then uh, I was also at the time reading a publication called Progression Magazine, which I believe is still around today. Very, very cool magazine that uh, just had reviews and interviews with uh, classic and current prog bands that came out, I got, I think, quarterly or whatever. So I subscribed to that. I started reading that. And then I saw a little ad somewhere that they were looking for writers. Okay, so I had been doing this Prognet thing for about a year. Met a lot of really cool people there. And I got a response back from one of the staff writers there. His name was James Bickers. James Bickers was the, uh, they had a kind of like progressive metal section of Progression Magazine where they strictly talked about and reviewed prog metal bands. And James had responded to me. He says, you know, I'm not really sure exactly what John Collins, who is the uh, editor, of and publisher of Progression Magazine. Not really sure exactly what he's doing right now uh, as far as like looking for new people. He goes, but I'm actually starting up this new magazine, print magazine, called Sea of Tranquility, and I'm looking for writers. Would you be interested in writing for me over at Sea of Tranquility? And I said, it's a gig, right? And I said, sure, I'm totally into that. So he says, we're just getting ready to publish our first print issue. And I could use a couple reviews. He goes, we're good. We're going to do prog metal and pro and straight prog stuff. He's like, so if you have anything you could review quick, send it to me. I'll get it in the issue, and we'll get you on board, and we'll go from there. So I think I think the first album I ever reviewed for Sea Tranquility was like a Nathan Mall uh, CD, which is a, a Canadian prog band. And um, I could contribute a couple others. I don't remember exactly what they were. I still have the issues, though. Uh, maybe I'll show them on one of the shows. I probably should have done that here. So uh, brought me on board. That first issue came out. And then, of course, it's time for the second issue. And I contributed. You know, he started sending. James started sending me because he said that's how it works in this business. You get sent like a packet of CDs. That's the stuff for you to review. Uh, if you have anything that you bought or whatever that you want to review, you could do that as well. And then he started hooking me up with interviews. So I started, you know, getting in touch with a lot of current prog musicians and doing interviews and I think we went so this was probably 1999 so it was 99 2000 so it was about two years that we were doing this and then in 2001 early 2001 James came to me and said and, and I you know I we had been doing a lot with the magazine you know we, we published I think five or six uh, it was like a quarterly thing <clears throat> um, well you know it was expensive to do and uh, not easy to put together. And, you know, we all had day jobs and all that kind of stuff. But uh, one day James came to me and he said, hey, I want to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So he said, listen, um, I had a long talk with John Collins. And he goes, my wife and I are going to have a, another baby. And I just took this new radio show gig. And, man, I just don't have the time for this anymore. So I talked to John Collins. And basically I sold him the rights to the print magazine. So the Sea Tranquility magazine is going to be no more. Um, you, if you would like, you could continue to write, but you'd be writing for uh, John. 
and there would there there would be a, a section of Progression magazine specifically toward you know geared towards like the Sea of Tranquility audience. He said, uh, so I'm welcome to put you in touch with John. You, you know, you can do that. He says, but uh, I got another idea too. I said, sure. He says, um, I am going to take Sea Tranquility to the web. He says, the, the deal I made with John and Progression is that we could no longer publish a print magazine, but we could certainly continue doing what we're doing on the internet. So I'm going to do that. So I was like, cool, I'm, st I'm sticking with you. Okay, so he started up a website, pretty crude at the time. Uh, started filling that with content, you know, reviews, whatever. But within like, I don't know, six or eight months or something like that, uh, James came back to me and said, man, I just I just don't have the time for this anymore. He goes, I know how passionate you seem to be at it. Uh, would you be interested in taking this over for me and just, you know, picking up the mantle? And I said, sure. So I agreed to become publisher of Seeing Track This was October of 2001. God, so long ago. And uh, a chunk of the writers stayed on with me, another chunk left, and either went on to Progression or went on to other websites and did other things, and we wished each other luck, and we started up with a small little crew, and about a year, I think a year after that, maybe a year and a half, two years after that, uh, one of my good friends, Greg Stewart, who is also a uh, web developer, we had a long talk, and he said, I can revamp this website, we'll uh, use some PHP software, and we'll just kind of totally redo this thing. And we did. And we made the website look much, much better than it had. And we brought in a bunch of writers from all over the world. I mean, at one point we had like 25 writers working under me, contributing content to Sea Tranquil. That is the height of SOT's, you know, kind of popularity there in the, you know, around 2005, 2008, 2010. We had a lot of people. I, I mean, I had people from, <clears throat> from Poland and a bunch in the UK, at least three or four in Canada, a whole bunch here in the US. I had some in uh, Romania. I mean, we just, we had writers everywhere, everywhere. So it was a, actually a very, very cool time period. We were reviewing tons of stuff. We were interviewing lots of bands. We were going to concerts, reviewing, you know, go, reviewing shows, interviews with bands and artists. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It took up a lot of time, but it was a lot of fun. Well, you know how times have changed, right? So fast forward to probably like, you know, 2013 or so, 2014. People are starting to, you know, prefer watching videos over reading stuff on, on the web. And, you know, it was just, it got to be hard to keep writers because even though, you know, we're not paying these people. So even though you get all this free music and you get to interview bands and go to shows and all that kind of stuff, and uh, which was fun, it, you know, most of these folks who were writing for me started getting married, having families, and before you know it, nobody has the time for this stuff. So, for, you know, for the last couple of years, we have gone on with a staff of about like maybe five, six, seven writers and we've just been chugging along. We're still doing what we're doing on, on the website, right? We're still reviewing a lot of product. We're still, you know, occasionally interviewing bands. We do polls on there. We do end of year best of uh, editorials and what have you. Um, but it's, you know, it is what it is. It's become like a kind of vehicle for album and book reviews and, you know, concert DVD reviews. That's basically what people, it's like a kind of like a, it's a, a library, a digital library of reviews of them. We've got like 22,000 reviews on there, all sorts of stuff. So if you haven't visited there in a while or maybe never have, you just follow the YouTube channel, I highly recommend you go to seatranquility.org. A lot of great stuff there. So um, about five years ago, so I guess we're talking about uh, 2014, I just, I happen to see a trend of a lot of people just kind of doing like these vlogs, these video blogs where they talk about music, review music on YouTube, and that seems to be, you know, kind of where people are going, what they want to, where they want to get their content. They want to view video. So I said, you know what, I'm going to give this thing a try. So I started up the Sea Tranquility YouTube channel, and I, you know, I go back and I look at some of those first, you know, dozen or so videos, and I'm like, uh, how crude, because I, you know, I'm a communications major. When I went to college, I was did the broadcasting thing. I did that for a couple of years, so I'm used to being in front of a camera. But it's it's different being in front of a camera and being able to kind of what you've been writing about for you know 10, 15 years to be able to then say it in front of a camera live and like in you know for an audience, right? 
So those first like bunch of videos, you know, I, I didn't quite get, you know, where do I sit here? How how high do I talk? All the, the settings, all this kind of stuff. How many, you know, how long should these videos be? What should they be about? So initially I was just doing straight product review shows. And, you know, it took a long time to start catching on. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd put out a, you know, post a video and I'd get like maybe 20 or 30 people watching it and subscribers were slow. But we carried on, right? We started doing new things. We started doing like history of band shows. We started doing concert review shows. We started doing all sorts of different types of programming, not specifically just the new product reviews. And that's when it started to pick up, okay? Little by little, we started getting subscribers. We started getting subscribers. And then, you know, YouTube um, doing this whole thing, you know, the monetization program. So, you know, the running of ads on videos, allowing you to make money. Okay, based on people watching your videos, people watching the ads, clicking on the ads, all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you know, the prospect of making a couple bucks from this, because let's be frank here, in all the years I've been doing Sea of Tranquility, whether on, you know, here on YouTube or on the website, we haven't made any money doing this. This has just, you know, it, it's basically, it's a sunk cost. We do this because we love it. So I've been actually losing money every year between hosting fees for the website every single month, mailing out CDs to writers all over the planet. I've spent a, I've spent a lot of money keeping this thing going over the years. So the prospect of being able to at least start making a little bit of money, got to do it, right? So, but the catch is you got to get to a thousand subscribers. Once you get to 1,000 subscribers, you then go through an approval process to get added to the monetization program. So it took four years to get there. Four years and a lot of videos to get to that 1,000 subscriber, which was end of June last year, 2018. Well, let me tell you, since then, and we got approved for the monetization program, we are now at almost 4,500 in just, what, six months, seven months? And I, I got to tell you, you guys have been great. Um, this channel has really taken off. Um, we've got so many different types of programs on here. You know, we got the listening room, top 10 songs, deep cuts on classic albums, best to worst albums, you know, concert reviews, all sorts of stuff. New product shows. I mean, I, we're doing so many things here. It's crazy. And you guys seem to love it. So I thank all of you. Um, and it's, it's just kind of interesting and this does happen from time to time. Uh, I'm out somewhere, maybe at a music event or something like that, and someone comes up to me and they tap me on the shoulder. It's like, hey, I just want to introduce myself. I watch your YouTube show all the time. I think you're doing a great job. And I'm like, Jesus. It's just, you know, small world, but it's just, it's kind of cool that people are watching and people like what I'm doing. And, and, just, and I'm going to tell you right now, the reason why I do this show, the reason why we do the website, it's not for me. I'm not trying to be famous. I have always wanted to just spread the word of music. I want to help these bands, many of whom struggle, right? They record these great albums, they go out on tour, they make no money for doing it. My whole reason for what I do here on this channel is to spread the word of the bands and the music, okay? That's really all it is. So whether it's like the old bands that maybe people haven't discovered, or it's the, especially the newer ones, the ones that are still out there doing stuff, is to spread the word of their music so people like you all can get you know introduced to some of this stuff by me talking about them, and hopefully you go out and you listen to and buy their music. Okay? And I know a lot of you want to see, I think what I've kind of heard it loud and clear, a lot of you really want to hear me talking about like the old classic stuff. Because let's face it, I've been listening to that stuff for a long, long time. I know a lot about it, and I'm happy talking about it and parlaying my knowledge and love for the music, and I think you guys appreciate that. But I just want to let it be known that while I love doing that too, my main focus of this channel is to spread the word of these bands and this music so you guys can then be intrigued enough to go out and investigate it on your own, whether you buy it or not. Okay, that's the reason why I really do this. It's for the musicians and the bands. Okay, I don't do this for the record labels. I don't do this for any of that kind of stuff. Uh, I do this to spread the word of music. And you guys seem to love music as much as I do. That's why you come here all the time, right? So I'm going to continue doing that. So that's kind of like the history. So here we are in 2019. Like I said, we've got just under 4,500 subscribers. We've got uh, well over a half a million views. And we're going to keep going, man. We're going to take this thing as far as we can go. And uh, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. So hopefully you guys like it. And there's a few of you out there who don't like it. Specifically, one guy who who insists on coming to this channel each and every week and posting comments uh, about how he's convinced I don't have a job and all I do is sit here 
all day long and post videos about bands nobody knows about. Well, let me tell you something, buddy. You're the fool who keeps coming here day after day watching them. So I guess uh, you know you must like it too. And I got to tell you, you can you can keep saying all you want about how I don't have a full-time job. I have a full-time job. I've been working for the same company for almost 17 years. If you want, I can give you their phone number. You can call them up and verify that I work there. So from now on, you keep posting stuff like that. I'm just going to delete it, okay, because I'm done having dialogue with you. Either come here and enjoy the channel or do me and everybody else a favor and go somewhere else, okay? And if you don't like what I do, start up your own channel. Okay, you're more than welcome to. Everybody's welcome to do that. So anyway, guys, but for 99.9% .9 of you who seem to like what I'm doing, thanks for coming each and every time. And uh, we appreciate all your views. And uh, tell all your friends, you know, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. All right, the more the better. So uh, that's the history of me and Sea Tranquility. Uh, we're going to keep doing this. All right, so uh, make sure you go to the web and visit us at www.seatranquility.org. or on Facebook, too. Daily polls. We're on Twitter, and of course we're here on YouTube. Uh, stay tuned. We've got. Uh, I am doing. Uh, if I don't get to it this week, probably over the weekend. I am going to do a forgotten favorites show, all with some new acquisitions of mine of like some really underground, obscure prog, hard rock, and proto metal stuff, uh, blues rock, and all that kind of stuff. Some really great stuff from like the '70s and the '80s that I've come into come into purchase lately that uh, I want to share with you. Uh, I'm going to do. I think my next top ten songs is going to be White Snake. Uh, I still haven't put that one together. We're going to have a uh, questions and answers coming up this weekend. And, man, all sorts of fun stuff, right? So stay tuned. We'll see you then. All right. Bye-bye.